HAT study, as we call it, was sponsored by the states of New York and New Jersey, represented through their environmental regulatory agencies, the Department of Environmental Conservation in New, Jer New York, and the Department of Environmental Protection in New Jersey. The study is also being done in full partnership with the New York City Office of Recovery and Resiliency. In this presentation, we have seven topics that we'll be going over. The study update status, the summary of scoping comments, the refinement of two alternative concepts, the explanation of preliminary benefits and costs, next steps, key items for further study, study schedule, and then contact information. Study status update. The study covers a vast geographic area, 25 counties covering both New York, northern New Jersey, and um, covers all of New York Harbor estuary and all the tributary rivers to the head of tide, uh, which on the Hudson River goes all the way up to Troy Lock and Dam. Uh, the geographic area covers 16 million people and uh, has fairly high coastal storm risk as experienced, unfortunately, through Hurricane Sandy and its repercussions. It's the most densely populated of the nine focus area studies coming from the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Report. Um, the study right now is just completed the interim report release, which is a non-decisional information document that we released to try to get information out to the public regarding what studies we performed in 2018, as well as the comments and responses to those comments that were received from the public through the scoping process that was done through the summer and fall of 2018. The study was begun with the signing of the feasibility cost sharing agreement, which cost shares the study 50-50 with the two states. The cost sharing agreement was signed on July 15th of 2016 and starts the clock for the study. We were successful at the end of 2018 in requesting and receiving an exemption to extend beyond the normal three-year study period to six years to allow for more interaction with the public an exchange on this very vital study so critically needed for this very developed and at-risk region. The study was announced in the Federal Register in February of 2018 and starting in July going through November we had a 122-day scoping process. The interim report was released in February 2019 and the next steps that we have are to have public meetings on the interim report which are underway now through a variety of different locations throughout the study area, and we are proceeding to move to the tentatively selected plan, basically refining the six conceptual alternatives that we have. That might best address the coastal storm risk that are facing the region. The ongoing work that we're doing now is basically refining the five alternatives, trying to refine them further, looking at their environmental impacts, their cost, refining the engineering designs. This all leads to what the Corps refers to as the tentatively selected plan milestone, which is scheduled for January of 2020. Once we release the draft report in March of 2020, we'll then have a number of additional public meetings to discuss that report and to solicit comments from other agencies as the public. Those will then be used to further refine the alternatives and to move forward to the final report and ultimately the study concludes with the Chief of Engineers report which is a recommendation to Congress made by our Chief of Engineers and Headquarters that it is scheduled to be done in July of 2022. This is an overview of the comments received from the public and agencies during our NEPA scoping period as well as our responses. We had a NEPA scoping period where we had significant and robust public engagement. During our NEPA scoping period, we had nine meetings total in six locations where we met with 705 meeting participants. During the comment period, the Corps of Engineers received 4,250 submissions of comments, which is a very robust and active public engagement for this study. The majority of the comments were identical, in fact 77% of them came from form letters, um, and there were many common themes and, and repeat comments. So comments came from members of the public, from municipalities, elected officials, as well as federal agencies. We grouped the comments into seven major themes that were uh, resounding throughout all of the comments, um, and we identified 393 unique comments 
and developed responses for each unique comment, and those can be found in the public engagement appendix to the interim report. The seven themes are environmental impacts, scoping process, storm surge and sea level rise, uh, cost and construction, overall study process, and induced flooding, and navigation impacts. So I'm going to go through the major comment themes, uh, what was said, and also um, our responses. So of the comments that we received in the seven major themes, 88% um, of commenters commented on the scoping process itself, um, requesting additional time or additional meetings, or requesting more comprehensive information and details about the alternatives to be provided to the public. So in response to this, we did hold four additional meetings, and the comment period was extended to last 120 days. 30 days are what's required by law for NEPA scoping. We also released the interim report, which is available on our website, um, and is it not a traditional report or release that we do. Uh, it's not required, but we wanted to get some more information out to the public in response to this overwhelming request for more information. Also, the public engagement process, by starting it early through NEPA scoping, allows the rest of the study to be shaped by the input that we receive from the public. The scoping process helps to define what our questions are that we need to be asking as a study team. And having that local knowledge and local input as we frame out what the questions will be is critical to helping to scope our studies. And that's why we hold the scoping process early before all of that information is available to allow for meaningful input into the study process. Another common comment that we received from 84% of commenters, in fact, was a concern that the study would only address storm surge and not sea level change. Um, because chronic flooding is exacerbated by regional sea level change in this region. And if you take anything away from our information that we're putting out to you, I hope that this is one thing that you take away. And that's that um, our studies, all of the alternatives, do include measures that would address regional sea level change. Um, and what we call them are complementary measures or measures that address frequent flooding. And the reason that we use the term frequent flooding and not just sea level rise flooding is because it's a bigger catch-all phrase that includes this, the, the flooding that you would see that would increase due to sea level rise, but also the existing frequent flooding already happening in some of the low-lying areas of our study area um, that have high tide flooding, sunny day flooding, um, that are already existing problems in the study area. So, we have added more information on sea level change, and we will be refining those complementary measures as we move forward in the study. 91% of comments expressed concern about potential environmental impacts from the alternatives that are being considered in this study. The concerns range from how would storm surge barriers or storm surge gates potentially aff affect tidal flow, how could it affect water quality, wildlife, ecology, PCBs that are already in the system, uh, and as well as potentially exacerbating combined sewage overflows that are already existing problems in many parts of the study area. Um, and this is a concern that the study team takes very seriously, and we know that environmental impact analysis is going to be a very big part of this study effort as we move through the various phases. Uh, we are doing a tiered NEPA analysis for this study. Um, which provides more opportunities for public engagement and feedback on our various alternatives than the typical NEPA process. Uh, and during this, this period, all of the um, potential impacts will be analyzed. First, at a more conceptual stage, as the concepts are largely conceptual still, and then in more site-specific detail as we refine and develop our alternatives further. 66% uh, of commenters also were concerned about potential impacts to navigation that could result from storm surge gates in the water. Uh, they were concerned about recreational and commercial um, maritime activities and how those might be impacted or restriction of vessel movement. Um, and also concerned about the potential of in-water gates to cause additional sedimentation in the shipping channel. So, this is something that we are going to look at very carefully for any in-water gates that move forward for further analysis. We will need to do a navigational traffic analysis 
of any of these barriers if they do move forward. Um, and we will be looking for ways to minimize, mitigate, and avoid potential impacts to navigation, um, as well as looking at potential sedimentation impacts um, through modeling of the alternatives. 77% of commenters were interested in the cost and construction duration of the various alternatives. They wanted to know what those would be for the alternatives and also what the non-federal partner responsibilities are in terms of cost sharing as well as implementation. For example, if the non-federal partners decided that they were not interested in moving forward in cost sharing, partnering on an implementation that's recommended, what would happen uh, going forward? And uh, so our cost appendix to the, to the interim report has a lot of information on this, including detailed information of how we developed our cost estimates at this early stage, um, as well as the construction duration, which varies greatly over the alternatives depending on what measures are included. Um, the Corps of Engineers does not do any actions unilaterally. We always partner with a non-federal partner uh, who cost share in the majority of our, of our studies. Um, and on this one, the, the study is cost shared 50-50 between the non-federal partners, which are the state of New Jersey and the state of New York, and that is split equally between them and the federal government. Um, and moving forward, if any of the partners were to decide that they don't support uh, the implementation of the project, then that would not move forward until an eligible party steps forward to cost share. 74% of commenters were interested in the overall study process. They wanted to know more about how the alternative selections were made um, and what the study timescale would be, as well as what was assumed in terms of sea level change um, and future without project conditions is what we call. So basically other projects going on by others or by us, but separate from our study that could potentially affect how things w work on the ground and um, need to be considered in how we design and consider and evaluate our alternatives. So um, there's a lot of information on this again in the interim report. Uh, we have fact sheets on all of the studies or projects that are included in our future without project conditions that you can read up on. Um, and we have more information about what assumptions we made for sea level rise, but the short of it is that for this preliminary analysis, we use the intermediate USACE curve um, for projections of what intermediate sea level rise would be in this area. And um, that's because we don't yet have probabilities on the likelihood of, of any of these curves occurring. And so we went with the middle. But going forward, we also plan to look at the historic or low end and the high projections. Um, and we also take adaptability very seriously in the Corps of Engineers. So when you're planning for uncertain future conditions, there really is a lot of uncertainty, and you have to be able to adapt to that, especially if you're considering large infrastructure solutions. And so we will be looking closely at potential adaptability that can be built into a project so that if the future does not pan out the way we've predicted, there's ways to adapt the project. Finally, 72% of commenters were concerned about the potential to induce flooding. So uh, commenters were concerned f in two ways. One, if you close storm surge barrier gates and capture fresh water behind those gates while those gates are closed during a large storm event, could that cause flooding behind the gate? But also, if you close gates for a hurricane or a large storm and f storm surge comes up and reflects off the barriers, what might happen to the communities on the outskirts of that barrier, outside of the barrier, per se. And so this is something that we have started to look at with some modeling, and we need to do a lot more of. Um, but I think the bottom line here really is that we cannot build a project that would induce flooding without mitigating for that flooding. And that cost of mitigation will be part of the study cost. It will be evaluated in the benefit to cost analysis. And if it's no longer viable in that perspective, that would be screened out. And another very important thing to note on this topic is that any mitigation needed for to avoid induced flooding would need to occur prior to the construction of the project so that you're not experiencing those impacts before they're mitigated. For this study, the scoping period helped the study team identify the key environmental impacts or concerns related to the study. And the interim report 
builds on that by gathering existing information about the study area using the data and different reports that we've combed through and collected and presenting that, as well as the key environmental considerations that will be looked at further as part of our impact analysis through the tiered NEPA process. We also identify our next steps for environmental impact analysis, which include identifying the physical changes to the system, to hydrology, sedimentation, um, et cetera, from the potential alternatives that are being evaluated. Um, and then in the future, we plan to uh, also identify additional needed analysis for environmental impacts beyond how those physical changes may cause impacts. So I think the bottom line on this, on this particular issue is that environmental evaluation is a huge part of this study and no construction will occur without full site-specific detailed analysis on any um, alternative before it can be implemented. And we are doing this in coordination with resource agencies, environmental resource agencies, as well as our partners, and there will be continued public engagement throughout the process. It was another topic that came up in a lot of the comments that we received. And this map here shows um, what all of the different environmental justice communities that we've identified are. In fact, the region contains diverse communities that might be affected by future coastal storm events. And for those of you who don't know, environmental justice means that you need to ensure that for any public investment, you're not having uh, disproportionate negative impacts on communities of color or low-income communities, and also that you're not reserving the environmental goods or the benefits for the already privileged communities, that it's impacting and, and benefiting more equally. So this study area is very diverse. In fact, 57% of the census block groups in our study area qualify as environmental justice communities, and that's captured here in this map in this slide. The interim report has more detailed and uh, zoomed in maps by, by region for our study reaches. The HAT study currently has six conceptual alternatives. One, no action alternative, which sets the baseline for comparison purposes for the other five with project alternatives, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The no action alternative basically outlines what we think the future in the study area will be without anything coming from the study. That is to say, all the things that are planned, underway, or been constructed to address coastal storm risk within the region, as well as other things that may occur over time, such as sea level change. This slide shows all the other projects that are assumed to be in place as part of the no action alternative. There's a number of shore protection projects underway or being planned by the Corps as well as other agencies that address a number of different areas along the, the coastal storm along the shoreline within the study area. The dots that are shown on this are primarily non-structural measures that are being done on critical infrastructure such as hospitals and railway stations. We basically remove these areas to the extent that these projects are going to protect those areas from coastal storm risks. We remove those from our analysis so that we don't double count the benefits of our alternatives. So it's an apple to apple comparison. So it's very critical to track these projects as the study proceeds. This slide shows the sea level rise that's projected for the battery. There's actually three different tide stations within the study area, given how vast it is, that project sea level rise. But they are, have similar curves. There's a high, intermediate, and low curve. On this curve, where you can see on the bottom left, the little squiggly line is the actual measured average annual sea level rise at the battery. Based on that trend of the last 25 years, we're using the intermediate for the preliminary analysis, but as the study proceeds, we anticipate doing sensitivity tests, at least for the high projection also, given that we don't know what the future holds. And so we want to make sure that the plan that we develop addresses all eventualities in case the high projection turns out to be what happens in 50 to 100 years from now. In terms of the with project slide alternative, Go ahead. In terms of the with project alternatives, we have five conceptual alternatives that have been outlined in the HAT study that span the spectrum from 
large in-water structures to solely shoreline-based structures at the other end. They're very conceptual at this stage of the study, but they do address some of the different approaches that have been used in other areas, as well as what might be thought of potentially feasible in this location as well. So to compare between these five conceptual alternatives, we've designed and come up with cost and benefit estimates for each alternative that address a particular storm event, which we've selected for this initial evaluation to use the 1% probability event, otherwise known as a 100-year storm, plus intermediate sea level rise. So we designed all of the structures and all of the various alternatives to that same measure, given that the 100-year event in some areas of the study uh, region have a 12-foot inundation, whereas in other areas it's well over 20 feet. So the design that you do in different locales is very different. So in terms of the benefits that were estimated, we used two different methods that will be discussed later. One was basically using a monetary method using a core existing model, and the other was using a GIS analysis. The GIS analysis basically estimated that in this study area, the 100-year event would cause a flooding of 291 square miles of area. It also did a risk analysis looking at different exposures for different critical infrastructure, property, uh, uh, population density, and other critical factors such as social vulnerability. Not identified in al these alternatives now, but to be added to these alternatives as the study proceeds, we anticipate adding additional structural, non-structural, and natural and nature-based features, both to complement some of the features that are within these alternatives and as separate standalone measures. So the public should be aware that these alternatives are subject to change by the addition, deletion, or modification of any of the features that were described within the alternatives. For the operation of the surge gates, we assumed as constant condition that the surge gates would initially be operated for the two-year storm event, which would say once on average every two years. But as sea level rise occurs, that would increase, and that is one of the main factors in the study as it proceeds for its surge gates is to define when and how they would be operated and for how long, given that it has a big effect not only on the economics of the project justification, but of the engineering in terms of the complementary features that would go along with surge gates, as well as with the environmental considerations associated with surge gates. Alternative two is by far the largest of all the alternatives that have been conceptualized. It basically involves a surge gate structure spanning from Sandy Hook to Breezy Point on Rockaway Peninsula, as well as a surge gate structure on the Throgs Neck along the East River. At each surge gate structure where it meets land, there's also shoreline-based measures that tie that off to high ground, going down along the Jersey shoreline, as well as back along the Rockaway Peninsula to the Nassau County border. In this alternative, it covers 95% of the area that would be inundated from a coastal storm with this feature. It also would address about 95% of the risks as measured through the GIS risk analysis. The benefits that it would help to claim, that is to say the damages that would be avoided by this alternative of the 187 billion potential damages that the 100-year storm event would cause, this would offset on a present worth basis 175 billion of those damages. So those are the benefits on a monetary basis. The cost for this alternative, which will be described later, which includes construction, operation, maintenance, rehabilitation, mitigation, um, through the project life of 50 years is estimated at $118 billion. This alternative also has the potential for induced flooding both in the Atlantic as well as Western Long Island Sound. That is to say, as the gates are closed during a storm event, the surge that accumulates in front of the gates might be worse because of that holding back the water from the surge. So for the areas that might be impacted from induced flooding, the mitigation for those impacts would have to be addressed and put in place prior to these alternatives or prior to these features being in the, uh, constructed. This alternative would also make many of the ongoing projects that are being done or have been done within the study area somewhat redundant in that it does have such vast geographic coverage. Alternative 3A. 
I'll turn 3A steps further back into the estuary. So in the spectrum of conceptual alternatives, this is, goes back in from where Alternatives 2 was. This involves a surge gate structure at the southern end of the Arthur Kill Channel, along the Verrazano Narrows between Brooklyn and Staten Island, and between Throgs Neck, uh, between Queens and the Bronx. It also involves a surge gate at Helen Bay Park area in the Bronx uh, at the headwaters of East Chester Bay. This alternative covers 74% of the area that would be inundated from the 100-year event, addresses 78% of the GIS risks that are posed to the area, would offset of the $187 billion in damages that would be caused, $171 billion would be offset, so those would be the benefits of this alternative, and the cost of this alternative is at $47 billion. Alternative 3B. Alternative 3B steps further back into the estuary along that spectrum of alternatives that we discussed. It has 54% of the area that would be inundated would be addressed. About 60% of the GIS risk would be avoided. About $160 billion of the $187 billion of damages would be offset and $43 billion in present worth cost from constructing and operating this alternative over the 50-year project life. Alternative 3A is defined by having an surge gate structure at the southern end of the Arthur Kill and the eastern end of the Kill Van Cold Tidal Straits, basically addressing coastal storm risk to the backside of Staten Island as well as to a lot of the in, inner New Jersey areas that, uh, exposed to coastal storm, shown on this slide in salmon color. It also involves a surge gate structure along the Jamaica Bay and Coney Island area, or alternative 3A. Alternative 3A also has a surge gate and shoreline base measures that address the Coney Island and Jamaica Bay and Rockway Peninsula area. This was developed separately as part of a separate study that was started immediately following Hurricane Sandy. It involves basically shoreline base measures that tie off to the high ground along the Verrazano Narrows, tying to shoreline base measures across Coney Island Creek, Coney Island going across Sheepshead Bay, Gerritsen Creek, uh, across Jamaica Bay Inlet with the surge gate structure, and then shoreline-based structures going along the Rockway Peninsula, basically addressing the coastal storm risk to the southern Brooklyn and southern Queens area. Alternative 3B also has, because it now the Hudson River as well as much of New York City is exposed to coastal storm risk, has a number of shoreline-based features as well as surge gates and shoreline-based features on a lot of the various creeks that exist within New York City area. It also has a number of shoreline-based features along the Hudson River as well, since it is now exposed to coastal storm risk. And the Hudson River has a particular propensity to coastal storm risk as sea level rise can, uh, occurs into the future. So this involves a number of features along Jersey City, lower Manhattan on the west side, um, which ties into a project that this New York City is developing along the East River. It also has East Harlem, Newtown Creek, Gowanus Creek, Astoria, Long Island City, Flushing Creek, Bronx River, and East Chester Creek. Uh, I'm sorry, West Chester Creek. In terms of area covered, Alternative 3B covers 54% of the area that would be inundated, 60% of the GIS risks of the $187 billion in damages. It would offset $161, so $161 billion in benefits at a cost of pres on a present worth basis of $43 billion. Alternative 4 steps further back into the estuary. It's largely the same as Alternative 3 in terms of the Hudson River and New York City area. It is different, though, in the New Jersey area in that instead of having a barrier on the Arthur Kill and KVK as a 3B, it has a barrier on the Hackensack River, which ties into high ground with shoreline-based measures. Of the area that would be inundated by the 100-year event, this would address 34.5% of that area. At, it would offset the risks to the resources in the region of 42% of the $187 billion in damages that would potentially occur over the project life. This would offset $148 billion at a cost of $32 billion on a present worth basis. Alternative 5 is defined by only having shoreline-based measures, no large in-water structures at all. So this severely limits the number of areas in which you can do coastal storm risk management within the study area, given the number of tidal straits, rivers, as well as creeks that exist within the area. It does, though, include ring walls and flood walls in the Hackensack Meadowlands, 
shoreline-based measures in Jersey City, along the lower west side of Manhattan Island, in East Harlem, Long Island City, and Astoria, Queens, as well as various areas along the Hudson River. The upcoming dates on this study. We have public meetings that are going on in the March and April of 2019 time period. We plan on releasing the draft interim we plan on releasing the draft integrated feasibility report and tier one EIS in March of 2020. Following that, we'll have public meetings on the draft report in April of 2020, and then a final report in March of 2021, and the study culminates in the Chief of Engineers report, currently scheduled for July of 2022. The interim report, which was released in February 19, 2019, is available on our website as well as all of the technical appendices to the report. All told, it's a little over 1,600 pages of information to which we hope the public will avail themselves and hopefully inform themselves in terms of the scope and the type of alternatives being evaluated in the study. There are a number of public meetings being held on the interim report throughout the study area in the March and April time periods of 2019. Comments on the interim report are always welcome but they would be most useful if they were provided early, ideally within April of 2019. That's it. The costs on the HATS project for the various alternatives were determined using a, an approach we call a parametric cost engineering approach. Parametric cost engineering is distinct from traditional bottom-up cost engineering, which takes plans and designs where we can calculate quantities of known amounts of materials and labor and equipment required for construction and assembles the cost bottom up. Parametric cost uh, estimates um, are also called top-down cost engineering approaches and these look at similar construction projects um, to, the, to the target. Parametric cost engineering takes a top-down approach by grounding the estimate in references of similar construction features. So in the case of storm surge barriers or levees and flood walls and other perimeter features, we look at similar projects that have used those features and grounded our cost estimates in those similar projects' costs. So taking up the two primary types of features separately, the shoreline features and the transect features, or the storm surge barriers, first we'll look at the, the shoreline costs. Over 100 miles of shoreline features were considered among the different alternatives. Per linear foot, unit prices were estimated based on Army Corps and partners' experiences in recent years. Three different categories were assigned to all features of very limited, limited, and unlimited in order to capture cost and access drivers. These different categories are a kind of catch-all to try to capture all kinds of types of cost drivers, everything from access because of nearby limitations due to transportation restrictions or work restrictions or even geologic considerations. So very limited corresponds with the highest cost of a given feature, unlimited corresponding with the lowest cost of a given feature. Natural and nature-based features, NNBFs, will be incorporated in the next levels of designs. This table shows you the costs corresponding with the very limited, limited, and unlimited categories for some of the most common features throughout the project alternatives. Flood walls, levees, seawalls, operable floodgates, elevated promenades, buried seawalls, and tide gates. Um, on the HATS project, the parametric approach was a refinement of the NAX approach that was developed in 2013 and applied to the specific conditions here in New York and New Jersey. On the HATS project, the parametric approach was a refinement of the process developed in the 2013 NAC study. We refined the NAC study's parametric approach by incorporating additional references and applying it to a higher level of design and the specific conditions 
of the New York, New Jersey Harbor as we've begun to design it. Um, the other major category of features incorporated into the various alternatives is, of course, the storm surge barriers. These are transect measures which run perpendicular to waterways and are distinct from perimeter features which run parallel to the coasts. The method for estimating the costs and durations of storm surge barriers was grounded in a statistical regression analysis of 17 large-scale storm surge barriers constructed around the world to date. The design dimensions selected were those that statistical analysis demonstrated to provide the greatest contribution towards cost and duration. On this slide, you can see all of the proposed barriers for the HAT study with the corresponding estimated construction cost and duration of construction. The formula for construction cost is shown in the footnote of the chart. This table only shows the estimated initial cost based on the parametric model discussed. This does not include contingency or other large cost drivers such as interest during construction. And more information about the process and references can be found in the cost appendix. To illustrate how the cost formula works, please see the schematic of one proposed alignment for the Verrazano Narrows barrier. This sample barrier, like the others in the study, can be separated into three parts. There's what we call the dam area, which corresponds with no moving parts and is just a physical barrier to stop water from moving. Then there's the auxiliary flow area, which allows water and wildlife to flow, but does not accommodate navigation. And then the largest of gates are the navigable areas, which accommodate navigation, recreational or industrial or otherwise. The statistical model we developed based off of the 17 reference barriers produced a formula that estimates about $3,000 per square foot of dam area, $14,000 per square foot of auxiliary flow area, and $19,000 per square foot of navigable area. And this is how we build our cost estimates for the storm surge barriers. On this slide, you see the total cost broken down by estimated construction cost, environmental and cultural mitigation, real estate, interest during construction, planning, engineering, and design, and supervision and administration, operations, maintenance, repair, and rehabilitation, and then the total sum of all those, and then finally the durations expected for construction of each of the five alternatives. This summary slide distills all of the cost estimates for the respective storm surge barriers and perimeter features for each of the alternatives. These costs are shown in 2019 U.S. dollars on a present worth basis, assuming a 50-year life cycle for the project duration corresponds with the construction duration for that feature of that alternative which has the largest duration. Army Corps Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Studies acknowledge all four accounts but focus on the National Economic Development Account. This analytical limitation has been acknowledged in the North Atlantic Comprehensive Coast Study and attempts to capture the remaining three accounts made some progress through the use of GIS data sets in the Comprehensive Coast Study. However, no method that considers all four accounts has been approved for use in Army Corps studies to date. Accordingly for now, the study team will identify on the broadest terms the national economic development benefit for this study while acknowledging that such an analysis needs the remaining four, three accounts to be complete. So that's already um, one partial here. We're just doing one out of the four accounts. Now let's dig a little deeper into the national economic development benefits category. Benefits are achieved through reducing flood damages to structures and their contents, reducing emergency costs and cleanup costs, and reducing lost productivity due to transportation delays. This is by no means an exhaustive list, 
It's just enough to give you an idea of the benefits that can be monetized under national economic development. And of these benefit types under national economic development, we focus on reducing flood damages to structures and their content in the interim report. What does this mean? It means that we are looking at the depreciated replacement value for these structures and their content, but that's not the whole picture. When you look at a library, it is more than just the building, the books, and the equipment inside. It's also a community hub and learning center. Roads, their physical value is a fraction of their actual worth, which is getting people to their jobs to increase productivity to society. These are what we call secondary and tertiary effects, and they are very hard to capture in the accepted Army Corps benefits models. So the monetized benefits in the interim report are very partial. Slide 30. The monetized benefits that appear in the report were calculated through a model called the Hydrologic Engineering Center Flood Damage Analysis also known as HEC FDA. It focuses on structures and their contents. So why did we use it if it's so limited? Well, for one, it produces the monetary outputs needed for national economic development benefits. It's been used in a lot of Army Corps studies also, so that allowed us to leverage information from existing studies instead of running out to collect more data. Also, it allows us to track the performance of an alternative over time and also to plug in sea level rise scenarios. For this interim report, we use the intermediate scenario, although we will look at the other scenarios of high and historic for the draft report in 2020. Now, as an alternative way to calculate benefits, we also considered using GIS-based outputs to be more inclusive and capture the four principles and guidelines accounts. So the details are on the next slide, slide 31. Here is the GIS risk analysis resulting in a composite risk index. You can check, there is a poster online that you can refer to on the study website. Now basically the study team and stakeholders communicated on what was important to them. Uh, infrastructure, population density, building value, social vulnerability, employment, and cultural resources resulting in weights for the exposure index, the blue box at the bottom, to describe what's at risk from flooding. Next, we take into account the probability of flooding, which is the yellow box in the middle, which then, put together with what's at risk from flooding, generates a composite risk index. This composite risk was used to create an output representing benefits from damages avoided analogous to the National Economic Development benefits from HEC FDA, but including the other three accounts from the principles and guidelines. Here are the preliminary benefits from both HEC FDA, so those are the NED benefits, and the GIS analysis, uh, that's all four accounts, presented here for comparison. Note that even as a very partial picture, the NED benefits are a very large scale going into hundreds of billions. The GIS results roughly follow the same distribution as the monetary benefits, but over a larger range. Now, the numbers are very large in part because they're in present value um, over the whole, uh, over many, many decades. The next step is to determine what a period of analysis is, which is 50 years, uh, typically starting from when the project is complete and we are accruing benefits. Once we have that period of analysis identified, then the benefits are presented in an annualized form. Um, so that will be um, not as large. As part of the refinements on the conceptual alternatives, the study team came up with preliminary benefits as presented in the interim report. So I'm going to provide some context on what these numbers actually include so that you can participate more meaningfully in the steps to get to the tentatively selected plan in 2020. There are two things to keep in mind as I go through the explanation. Uh, the first is that these benefits are partial estimates. There is not enough information for a recommendation. 
not even a tentative one. Uh, the second thing is that there are many investigation needs to get to the tentatively selected plan. And this is where your feedback is going to be the most productive in our planning process. Which investigations are most important to you? Is it the induced flooding impacts, tidal exchange, salinity, or navigation impacts, among many others? Here is a map that shows how our study area was broken out into 64 reaches for estimating benefits by water body, county line, and existing or assumed Army Corps projects. Do you see how the south shore of Staten Island is broken down? This allowed the economist to plug in the elevation of the upcoming Army Corps project into the economics model before running the effects of any of the proposed measures under this study. So that's just a quick example of how we incorporated existing and assumed projects into our preliminary economics calculations. Under benefits, the Army Corps considers four accounts established in the principles and guidelines from 1983. National Economic Development, NED, Environmental Quality, EQ, Other Social Effects, OSE, and Regional Economic Development, RED, benefits. Typically, Army Corps Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Studies acknowledge all four accounts, but focus on the National Economic Development account. The benefits from both HEC FDA and the GIS analysis are presented here for a comparison. Note that even as a very partial picture, the National Economic Development benefits are very large scale, going into the hundreds of billions of dollars in present value. The GIS results roughly follow the distribution of the monetary benefit, but over a larger range. So as we move from the interim report to the draft report, we're going to be looking beyond the intermediate scenario of sea level rise at the historic or low rate of sea level rise and the high rate of sea level rise and how they affect the benefits. Now the high scenario will assume more damages to be prevented, so typically the benefits do go up. It's balanced, on the other hand, by more robust solutions needed to address the high rate of sea level rise. Uh, another factor for further study as we move to the draft report is that we have to expand beyond the NED benefits, so we're going to figure out how to marry up the, any, the National Economic Development benefits from HEC FDA and the GIS analysis to better capture all of the four accounts from the principles and guidelines. Hi, my name is Dog Madera. I'm the project geographer on the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the GIS analysis that was conducted as a part of this study. The GIS analysis was modeled after, uh, after the effort put forth in the NACCS, or the North Atlantic Comprehensive Coast Study, a uh, previous study completed by the Corps of Engineers in early 2015. With regards to that effort, we made use of the data that was available within the NACCS and we reached out to a number of the organizations that had provided us that data, uh, asking for updates. We also um, did some research and looked to collect any new data. So we updated the data that we had, and we collected any new data that was pertinent. Uh, we organized all of that data into various groups or categories, uh, which were called uh, indices or indexes. There are six indexes within this analysis. Uh, infrastructure, population density, building value, social vulnerability, employment, and cultural resources. All of that information, after it's grouped together, all is given, all, each of those indices are given weights. Those weights uh, were provided to us by the local sponsors and partners, and those weights were determined by the local partners and sponsors. We were looking to have their input as to what they value protecting the most. 
all of those different indices then factor into a total composite exposure. Looking at the GIS slide, in the lower left, in blue, is a representation of the total uh, composite exposure. In essence, every 10 meter by 10 meter cell was given a value. Uh, and that value is not in dollars, but is a value from 0 to 100 relative to all the other cells within the study area. So all of the information that I referenced earlier is collected, weighted, we produce this exposure, which looks to, seeks to represent the people, the infrastructure, the resources that we're looking to protect or are exposed to uh, coastal flooding, um, uh, po the possibility of coastal flooding. Again, in essence, the exposure looks to or seeks to represent what the local sponsors and partners uh, would call the people, the infrastructure, and the resources that they seek to protect. And each of those 10 by 10 meter cells uh, are given a score relative to all the cells within the study area. That represents the exposure or the risk to damage. Um, we take that exposure and we multiply it by the vulnerability or the likelihood in which any given area would flood. Uh, that vulnerability is on the GIS slide and appears in orange or yellow. What the data that factors into the vulnerability, in essence, are uh, two uh, flooding extents, or flooding bands, as I might call them. One is a 10-year probability event, and the other is a 100-year plus three feet event. Those flooding bands were chosen to mimic what was completed as a part of the economic analysis. There's slight differences, but in essence, it's looking to mimic and therefore double check the results of the economic analysis. But to again, to summarize with regards to the slide, the exposure in blue is multiplied by the vulnerability or flooding uh, probability in orange to therefore produce risk. And what you're then receiving is again, uh, you're receiving a set of scores from zero to 100 representing those cells that are subjected to the most risk uh, versus the least. And that comes from, again, the exposure and vulnerability. I will go back to point out that there, you know, the slide that you're seeing as a part of this, uh, representing, is, is in essence trying to simplify the process. There's a lot more details that are worked into the analysis. For instance, with the exposure index uh, representing infrastructure, uh, some of the different exposure indexes have many different data sets that factor into them. As an example, infrastructure has nearly, I think it's 40 to 50 data sets that factor into it. Um, all of those received subweights. And one of the things that we were very excited to do was with regards to certain data sets such as train stations or airports, we looked to factor in the ridership or the number of passengers that were moving through that station or airport. So we, can, we compiled lots of data as to the different train stations and depending on the number of people going through turnstiles impacts the weight that we assign to that train station. Uh, same for the airports. Um, again, um, there are multiple data sets that feed into those various indexes. Two of the indices are new relative to the NACCS. In discussions with the local partners and sponsors and the PDT, the project delivery team, um, we identified two new data sets that we thought would, be, would add value, uh, one being the building value. In the NACCS, there wasn't a data set that represented building value. To try to mimic what was done in the economic analysis, um, we incorporated building value uh, a data set that we received through the census has us. Um, another new inde index was the employment index. And in discussions again with the local sponsors, partners, and PDT, given that we were representing population density or where people you know, live and sleep at night, we wanted to also factor in you know, where they work during the day. So the employment index was incorporated. As to let me, some other details um, that I can add to this slide, um, the vulnerability 
uh, those flooding extents, those were determined with the most recent output from uh, a modeling effort called ADCIRC uh, that was produced by the uh, produced by the NACCS effort, the North Atlantic Comprehensive Coastal Study. Uh, so it's making use of the most recent data that we have with regards to flooding extent and water levels. And it also factors in a number of future without project condition projects. What we're looking to do, what we seek to do, was to capture projects that were either recently completed or soon to be, we anticipate, soon to be completed. Meaning that they have uh, funding and or permits in place and are ready with, uh, to move forward come July 2020. Um, those we're assuming would be completed in those instances where we could where we could gather alignment information as to the locations of those projects we made use of that information to impact the vulnerability therefore on the topographic uh, DEM we burned in the location of that future project and raised that elevation to show that that project was in existence and therefore the areas behind it may not flood during a particular flooding extent. Another point I'd like to make is the fact that as a part of this GIS study we incorporated what we call a slider tool. We worked with the local sponsors and partners um, and we wanted to allow them to make the part of the analysis a little more interactive. We wanted their feedback as to the weights for the various indexes. So to make that a little bit easier, uh, within ArcGIS, uh, the software in which the GIS analysis was completed, we created a tool where we could share that ArcGIS project with the local sponsor or partner and allow them to rerun the analysis with different weights uh, just by using a slider tool to change the percentages in which they weight uh, various indices. That concludes my presentation on the GIS analysis, risk analysis conducted for this study. Uh, additional details as to the analysis itself can be found in the GIS appendix and thank you for attending.